Good afternoon. Sorry for the delay, but we're ready to begin now. Uh, let's have opening prayer. Father in heaven, <laughs> I want to thank you in a special way for this day. You are good and kind. You have blessed us. I ask for your angels to be in this room. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> it's my privilege to introduce Alyssa Kido. Alyssa, you might as well just stand up here oh, with me. Sure. Uh, we worked together in St. Louis when I was pastoring the St. Louis Church. Alyssa and her husband, Dan attended there. Dan worked at Washington University, and you worked at the University of St. Louis, or? No, I was at, where was I at? Webster, 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 Webster University. Webster University. Uh, what is unique about Dan and Alyssa is they just don't talk education. They love education. And they love young people. And when I was pastoring the Central Church, which is right next door to Washington University, we had university kids in church every week. Because every Friday night they opened their home. And their home was full of university students. And they just fellowshiped. And then the overflow would come to church. I gave many Bible studies to university students and helped answer questions. So you think, well, you have college professors. Okay, they work with college students. But this couple loves education at every level. And when we were starting in ninth grade, at Hillcrest School. Alyssa came and volunteered and was one of our teachers, teaching writing and composition, had a powerful impact on our educational superintendent. And they just loved kids at every level of education. They've had a profound impact on my own kids' lives as they attended Hillcrest School. And Alyssa has now been doing groundbreaking research that the highest levels of education would never predict, and she has shown the blessing of God. And Alyssa, I'm so glad you're here. Thank well, you. Okay. Well, thank you, Pastor Dean. Now, I would not be here were it not for Melissa and Pastor Dean. I knew Melissa when she was in the 10th grade. I was her English teacher. And look at her now. I'm so, so proud of her. And I regret that I may not get to meet her husband. Uh, maybe I will. But I met Lily. And uh, Luke is at Union College, my favorite college, actually, even though I'm at La Sierra University. So um, maybe I could tell you, after that big drum roll from <laughs> Pastor Dean, maybe I'll back up a little bit and say to you, um, I did not grow up an Adventist. Uh, my parents were not Adventists. They were good people, but they didn't go to church. I did have an aunt and a grandmother who were Seventh-day Adventists, and it's because of them that uh, I went to Pacific Union College up in California. And that's where I tell people I met the two most important people in my life, and that was God and my husband, Danny. Now, <clears throat> you know, Danny was raised in Adventist, and he will tell you if you read, I don't know if you knew, any of you have seen the book Thriving in the bookstore, has a green cover on it, with a plant, go look for it because it's written by my colleague. And uh, I think it's 31 chapters 
every chapter is about an Adventist who had mostly, if not all, Adventist education and what happened to them. And so I'm not bragging, I'm just being objective. My husband is in that book. In fact, her name is Amy Loikert, and she interviewed him. She, he was the first interview because she just wanted to try things out, and he made the cut, so he's in the, he's in the book. But I'd recommend that book to you, especially if you have someone you'd like to pass it on to. You know, um, I think I can move away from here. Uh, when I talk to parents, and parents say to me, well, I'm thinking about transferring my child to this school or that school, and I'll say, why? And they'll say, well, I don't think he or she will be able to go to a good graduate school or, you know, go into a good profession with just an Adventist education. And so then God has provided me with a card in my back pocket, and I pull it out, and this is the card I pull out. I say, my husband had Adventist education from grade one through medical school, and where do you think his first job was? They can't guess, so I have to tell them. Harvard University. Now, everybody knows Harvard University. He tells me, I think it's okay to say this in public, <laughs> that there are some schools that are better than Harvard University. But if he'd gone there first, the parent wouldn't have recognized the name of the school, right? And realized that it was uh, the, the best schools, but they would recognize Harvard. So it was Harvard that he, he gave Danny's first job to. Now, since we've been married, I have always been like running behind him, trying to catch up, because I didn't have an Adventist education. I didn't know all the prophecies. When he was in the fifth grade, he learned the 2300-day prophecy, and that prophecy gave him like a, a map, an outline for him to draw and see where history was, where history was going, and where he could hang this and this and that. And then when you got the uh, great controversy, that was another thing he could hang up there. And so I've always felt like I've been running behind him. Sometimes I catch up a little, and then he says something to me, we talk about something, I realize I've fallen back. I mean, I'm not as far up there as I thought I was. But, you know, God has been helping me and nudging me along and pulling me along. So let me start. So I want to talk to, did I say I wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for Melissa and for Pastor Dean? They know of some of the research that I've been doing, but they also, Melissa, as the superintendent of Missouri, Iowa, Missouri, has participated in our study. So your students in your schools in Iowa, Missouri, are in the data that I'm going to present to you today. And um, theoretically, we may be coming ne back next year. Of course, we've got to persuade Melissa to help us with more data next year so we can have longitudinal. You know, we can show how much the kids have grown from this point to this point. Okay, so... Um, uh, they can see this picture. Can they see it? Yep, they can. Thank you. Thank you. I can advance my own slides? No, I cannot advance my Okay, so next, please. May I ask you one question before we, we go? Um, can I put this on presenter mode up here? Okay. All right, so um, let's see. Okay, very good. How many of you have seen this documentary called The Blueprint? Oh, slides here? Just tap. Oh, okay, like. Just tap right here. And then if you want to go back. Slide like this? This one's live. Okay. And then forward is slide. Okay. So Thank you. 
All right, so I think Melissa's probably the only one that's seen the blueprint, because I didn't see anybody else's hands up. Did I? Oh, okay, we got another hand here. Oh, another, okay, very good. We got a few hands, but not enough. So this is still available, but let me give you background to this. One day out of the blue, somebody c called Martin Dopemeyer. See, I did something to his, nope, I went too far. Oh dear, okay, I'll leave it right there for now. Someone called Martin, Martin Dopemeyer, called me on the phone and he said to me, you know, I've read about your study in the Christian Science Monitor. And he said, um, could I talk to you more about it? And um, he said, after we talked, he said, you know, I'm quoting him. He called it an extraordinary story. He said, I think we need to tell this story to more people. And so I said, okay. He said, and I would like to be the filmmaker that does it. So we started working together. And the first thing he had to do was he had to select what schools were going to be in the documentary. So I said, okay, we'll do this school, this school, this school. And he said, no, 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 Alyssa, this is a documentary. You can't tell me what schools to put in it. I said, oh, okay. So he said, just give me a list of schools in all the different areas across the U.S., Canada. I don't think he went to Bermuda. But he said, give me a list of the schools. I'll go out and scalp them. So I said, OK. We gave him the list. And he went out to scout. And I tell you, I had to have big lungs to hold my breath for as long as it took him to scout. I was waiting for him to come back and tell me. I thought, I hope he doesn't, I hope he sees all the good stuff. Not that we don't have maybe the best equipment in our chemistry lab, and maybe um, the outside of our uh, property doesn't look as great as it could. What do they call that? Um, curbside appeal, curb appeal. Some of our schools don't have great curb appeal. So I said, I hope he doesn't see that. I hope he sees the essentials, the really great things that are happening in our schools. And you know, he did. And when he came back, he said, okay, he said, Alyssa, you have, let me see if I can do this. Nope. Uh, did it go? Yes. Tap the actual thing. Okay. He said, Alyssa, you have real stars out there. I said, what do you mean? He said, your teachers, your principals. They're such a dedicated, committed group. They do work, great work out there. And he'd been to a school where they didn't have a, uh, a lab, science lab. And he, the teacher that morning got a cardboard box, went to her kitchen, put in stuff for the experiment for that day, went to school and did the experiment from the stuff in her kitchen. That's what our teachers do. So he was really, really impressed. And from then on, I called them real stars. Like, do we have any other teachers in here besides Melissa right now? Oh, we do. Okay. Well, all right. Okay, you're stars, real stars. Okay, so the film is out there. It was on PBS for two years, and then they asked if they could renew our contract because it gotten so many hits they wanted to show it again, so we said okay. But it's, it's not on PBS anymore on TV, but it's available in a DVD. Now, mm, okay, did you say t tap? Okay, I don't know what I did. You, you moved it for me? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Doug. Okay, so this is the study that put us on the map, that has put Adventist education on the map. It was called Cognitive Genesis. This is the study that Martin Dobermeyer saw the results of that said we need to make a film about this. Cognitive Genesis. It was the entire North American division that included Canada and um, 
Bermuda. I'm not sure where Bermuda is. It's over here. Somewhere, Bermuda, wherever you, you know where Bermuda is. I got Canada up there. Okay, so it involved, it involved 800 schools, 800 plus schools, 51,706 students in grades three through nine and 11, parents of the participating students and teachers and principals at the participating schools. Now, it was a while ago, so some of the teachers were, too, were young enough to be in the study, I think, which is a little disheartening to me, but what can I say? It's, that's life, right? <laughs> Anyhow, um, I have 51 students up there, but you have to know it was more like 72 students. Every student have to have all the data lined up, otherwise we kick them out. So if you missed a day of testing, you were out. If your parent forgot to fill out the survey in time, you were out. Any one of those things. But so in the final database, we had 51 uh, students. And these are the results. Students in Adventist schools outnumbered Okay, the national average outperformed the national average on standardized test. Did I hear an amen out there? Amen. Very good. I know we're not in church, church, but I tell when I go to church, I say, you can say amen. You can say hallelujah. You know, you can raise your hands. Because this, I'll tell you, School districts came to me and asked me, how did you, how, what are you t people doing there that you can get that kind of result? Here, here's what else. They outperformed the national average, not in one subject or in two, but how many subjects? All subjects. And for all grade levels, mind you, all grade levels, third grade through ninth grade, we skipped 10 and we went to 11. Okay, now they scored above their predicted, expect, expected achievement. So what does that mean? That means if Joey scored here on his ability test and we gave them ability tests, we would want Joey to score right here, even with his ability. Some places like the Los Angeles Unified School District where I'm close to, they score down here and they spend all kinds of money trying to get them up here. They never get them up here, but they try. Okay, Ad kids in Adventist school scored up here. They were above, okay, their predicted ability. So I like to call them overachievers. Do you like this kid? I think he looks cute. Okay. Now, the important part, or another important part, was that they increased in ability. I like this slide, too. But I, my husband, Danny, says, he's sitting there, he says, you should make more about ability, increase in ability, because that doesn't happen very much, and it doesn't happen as much as it did in our population. And uh, Rachel? Rebecca. Rebecca. Rebecca is a statistician. I don't know her last name, but she's a statistician, so I know she, she'll understand some of these things here. Okay, so um, if I were to ask you now, is there an advantage to Seventh-day Adventist education, what would you say? Okay, we got a smart class here. Yeah, I'd say yes. I'd say absolutely yes. Now, a lot of our schools that I've been associated with are small. So the school I volunteer at, Marino, no, Valley Adventist Christian School has two teachers, one of whom is the principal, and they had an eighth grade of five students, five students. I told this story in another session. I'm pretty sure I did. But these kids on their map, this now it's map tests. 
not Iowa achievement, but MAP tests, four areas of uh, evaluation. They scored very well, and they, one, one young woman was off the charts. And this was at a small school with only two teachers, and she only had four classmates in her eighth grade class. So they do really well academically, and they do really well in school sizes. In fact, when we compare the results of small school versus big school, there usually is not much difference. But when there is, the difference is in favor of the small school. Does that surprise you? It shouldn't surprise you, right? Because great things, wonderful things come in small packages. And, um, you know, God has blessed our system. He gave us the blueprint. And I want to go back to the uh, DVD. Martin Doblemeyer, the filmmaker, chose that title for his DVD. Some people would say, oh, you know, we don't want to call it the blueprint because of Ellen White or whatever they want to say about it. But it's because of Ellen White that we have the blueprint. Ellen White said, let's give our kids something better. And something better, okay, is what I think is on the next slide. What's our advantage? What's the Adventist advantage? What is the something better? It's that in everything in our schools, we infuse the spiritual into the physical, the mental, the social and emotional. That spiritual is infused there. And parents will ask me, um, parents will ask me, well, what difference does it make about the spiritual? Because we take them to church. Sometimes we go to um, prayer meeting Wednesday night, and the kids participate in Pathfinders. Well, uh, a graduate student named Marianne Gilbert said, I want to see what the data actually shows. And so she did a study, and her study was titled, Do Spiritual Factors Impact Academic Achievement? So she looked at the academic. She had the data from the spiritual from the 51,000 students. Remember, 51,000 students? OK, and this is what she found. She found that large gains in academic achievement and large gains were called in, calling 8.5 months or more correlated with these three factors, religion and spirituality emphasized in the school, mother spirituality, and teacher spirituality. So when we had those three things going, the students who had the, those factors operating for them, they were 8.5 or more months ahead in academic achievement. I heard somebody say, wow, so that's good. Thank you for that encouragement. Yeah, I, now I, I like to tease the father. What, fathers, what happened here, fathers? The fathers aren't, aren't amused. <laughs> but. You know, it's, it's always been, I think if, I'm not sure how they know it, but the mother has always been the spiritual nurturer in the majority of families, I think. And it seemed in our population of Adventist families, that was also the case. Okay, so if I ask you this question, is there a spiritual advantage to Adventist education? You'd say what? Yes, and you know, I like to say absolutely yes. Okay, so we have all these results. And I'm so busy disseminating the results, telling people about it, going school, from school to school, conference to conference, uh, showing them the results, that um, I didn't take time to do what some people wanted me to do, and that is they, want, they asked me, well, why? They said, why did you get the results that you did? And then how did you do it? Well, I said, I don't know. I didn't do anything. It was the teachers in the classrooms that were doing the how, but the why. And so a group of us got a study group together in which we tried to think, what is it about Adventist education? What happens in the classrooms that may be a factor influencing their academic achievement? And after a long time and after a, a lot of study, 
with a group of mixed, uh, pe mixed people, that doesn't sound very good, does it? Uh, with a variety of people, with variety of skills, we settled on this, and that was, let's take a look at worldview. Did you know that 60, before the age of 18, 64% or two out of three accept Christ? Two out of three. This is from Barna Research. Okay, so, and he further found that by the age of 13, they have a worldview. It may not be fully developed, but they have a worldview by the age of 13. So we ask ourselves, what is worldview? And here are a couple of definitions. It's the operating system we use to navigate life. It's a set of ideas, beliefs, and attitudes about the world. Worldview governs our thoughts, decisions, and actions. Another way of looking at it is it's the lens through which we see life. There are four major worldviews according to our paradigm and according to the book that my husband's written. Um, I'm gonna make a plug for that too in the bookstore, but I think it's all sold out, I think. I'm not positive. But if it is, and you would like a copy of it, you're really wanting a copy of it, you can see me and I, I'll arrange for the center uh, that I direct to send it to you. Okay, so there are four major worldviews. Others first, rules first, me first, and feelings work first. And here's the decision-making process. Here's where it comes into play. Whatever world view you have uh, influences how you make a decision. So if you have a problem or a need, then you get some information. I notice I'm missing it. Oh no, there's the end. You get a solution, you either take action or no action, and then there's an outcome. And notice from outcome, we go back to information as a feedback loop. So depending on whether you rule, you have a world view of feelings, rules, me and others, it will influence what kind of decision you come to. Um, the book he has is Make Your Choices Better Than Chance. Do you realize that statistically it's 50-50? It's like throwing up a coin and watching where it f drops. Do you want your decisions, do you want your kids' decisions, your grandkids' decisions to be 50-50? I don't think so, right? So, but if they have the right worldview, the chances increase tremendously that it will not be 50-50, they'll have a good outcome. So our question was this, can a student's worldview predict increase in achievement and ability? We're looking to see, will it make any difference? Okay, we're promoting in our schools, developing our schools, Christ's worldview, okay? The other's first worldview. Does it make a difference or can, can we just forget about it? So let's see what our hypothesis is. Here was our hypothesis. The right worldview optimizes decision-making that results in improvement in a student's ability, achievement and ability. And we used a worldview inventory that um, some of us created, and then we had uh, God's providence ha help us. So the group that created it, none of us were test makers. You know, we, we, had, we, we had not made a test like this. And so we went to uh, Riverside Publishing, or Iowa, who made the Iowa test, and we said, say, can you uh, help us? We need some help with this. And they said, well, we can't help you because it would be a conflict of interest because we're developing our own. So they said, but we can give you a contact. And the contact they gave us was to a gentleman called Gail Royd. Now, I don't know how many people have heard of this test aside from our teachers, 
but Gail Royd was the author of the fifth edition of the Stanford Binet Intelligence Test. And he was the co-author of the sixth edition of the Stanford Binet Intelligence Test. Anybody heard of Stanford Binet Intelligence? Yeah, we got one here, one there. Yeah, we have a handful, okay. So we thought that was pretty providential when I called him and told him what we were doing. He said, I think I'll help you, but first send me your data. I want to look at it myself. I want to do the, um, what's the, what, Danny, what is the thing that he did? I can't hear you. Okay, well, anyway, he got the data. He analyzed it himself. It came out just like ours, and he says, okay, I'm on board. And so from then on, we had this expert helping us. And uh, we always chalk that up to providence, to God's providence. All right, now, I'm going to tell you a little about, a bit about this guy. I have to tell you frankly, I just learned about this fellow, OK? But it's important. Well, that's not important. You'll understand when you see when we talk about the results. All right, this fellow, he's Danish. George Roche was a statistician, a mathematician, a really intelligent guy. He developed a unit, which we now call the RIT, the Roche unit, by which to evaluate and assess and then predict growth for various tests. So the MAP test that your students take is given to Melissa in RITs. Then they have to convert it to percentiles. I didn't convert to percentiles, but the next time I'm here, which Rob says I'm, we might be here next year, I'll bring this percentile. But uh, I want to show you the results of four areas and then another area. So take a look at this. Reading others, I mean rules others me feelings. This is for the reading test. You see the, ten, the pencils, and at the top is the RIT number. So you can determine where is the lowest RIT number. I'm giving you a little quiz here, just to check if you've fallen asleep on me or not. What's the lowest RIT number? Me. Who? Me. me, and it's what? 204, okay, all right. That's a pretty big jump between 214 and 204, right? Okay, and they call it um, not statistically significant, but educationally significant based on this rating. All right, so you can see that the me first person, right, has very low score on reading. Rules and others are up there together, and then feelings over here is okay, but me is really bad. I shouldn't say bad. Me is very low. <laughs> okay, I don't, all right. Now, let's look at language, language usage. Okay, here's my other little quiz now. Uh, what's the highest? What worldview is the highest? Others. others, okay. So students who have an others first worldview score the highest on this language usage test. And who's down here low again? Me. Me, yeah, okay. This, I have a pretty good class, huh? Pretty, cl okay, we're on board there. All right, so now let's move over to science and see what we do in science. Science, how does that look? Oh, look, what happened with feelings? It's gone because there was no da data for that. We didn't have any feelings students on that. But take a look at me again, and what do we have? Yes, me first, the student, the person that's always concerned and only concerned about me, okay, does not do well academically, does not do well on reading, language arts, and now science. But look, up, look at the two things that are doing always pretty well. What two things are they? Rules and others. Now, I think you'd agree with me that rules could be good or rules could be bad, right? 
Um, if you go to a church, young person goes to a church that's very rules-oriented, that might not be so good. But if, but if that young person goes to a church that, that's principle-oriented, that operates by principle, that'd probably be okay. All right, let's see the last one. Let's see math now. Okay, take a look at math. What do you think about that? Look at the feelings. It's high up there, right? It's high. In fact, it's a little bit higher than rules and a little bit higher than others and certainly higher than me. Now, if some of you are going to ask me about why rules, I mean, why math is so high with feelings, I'm going to tell you at this point I have no idea. But ask me next year, ask me next year, and I'll be able to tell you. I think I'll be able to tell you, okay? But right now, it's the highest, isn't it? And it's a feeling. So are the kids who, are, who operate by a worldview of feelings somehow connect with math better? I don't know, but I'll have some maybe hypotheses for you next time. So let's look at a little bit of a summary here. Rules and others oriented worldviews are associated with higher academic performance. Consistent rules orientation seems to be beneficial for academic performance. Mixed results for me and feelings across the subject. We're not going to do what I did and call me bad. I'm just going to say the, the results are mixed. But next year, because I'm pretty sure that your superintendent of education is going to participate another year in this study, and so we'll have two points of data to compare. We'll have some, a little bit of longitudinal, and I hope that I can come to you with some explanation about the feelings and the math. I am also going to come to you with this. Do you agree that most of us are probably not just one worldview? Do I operate always with others' worldview? No, I don't, you know. Sometimes I, I may stoop to rules. Not stoop, no. I may stoop to me, me first, you know. That's no good. But most of us have a primary worldview and then a secondary worldview, and that's what we're finding in the research. So I want to give you a little preview of something that we'll, we'll be sharing with you next uh, year. Take a look at this. This is, whoops, will you take me back to that? Sorry, did I do that? Yeah, thank you. Okay, this is primary secondary worldview. Notice the red pencil is rules and others, correct? Okay, then the yellow one is, I can't read, rules and me. The middle one, rules and feelings. Others and rules, me and rules. These are the top five uh, mixed uh, data for primary, secondary worldviews. And you can see that others and rules has the highest score. Correct? OK, that's for science, just for science. When we come back next year, we'll have the full range of everything, and, and you'll be able to have a better idea. So now. How do we, if we agree that others first, that Jesus' approach to life, that his worldview was others first, how do we help our children and our grandchildren develop others, maybe rules, worldview? How do we do that? I want to suggest that there's a way that it happens passively. So I talked about mirror neurons today, I think, or yesterday, I don't know. Not all of you were there anyway. So mirror neurons are neurons that God created in our brains that makes a picture of everything it sees, OK? And these mirror neurons was, were not discovered until maybe 20, 25 years ago when Danny came home from work one day and said, hey, you have to learn about mirror neurons. I said, oh, OK. And uh, I think he gave me a couple of books. 
So here's when one observes an action or an emotion, it automatically triggers a mirroring behavior of that action or motion. So we mentally imitate every action we witness, prompting us to yawn or dance or grieve with others. Now, if I were doing this on my own computer, you'd see this guy yawning and going like this. Have you wondered why you yawn when somebody else yawns? I thought it was something in the air. It's not in the air. It's a mirror neuron, okay? So now, what about, what about the character, what about Jesus being mirrored in our schools? If he's there, we see in the behavior of the teachers, the content of the textbook, the kids, the parents, if they can see Jesus mirrored, they're creating a mirror neuron themselves, okay? George Akers, a theologian a long time ago, but who was very interested and involved in Adventist education said this, the overarching purpose of our schools the macro effect, when it's all said and done, is to give our youth a Christian worldview to see everything from God's worldview, point of view, as revealed in his inspired word. It's giving our students a Christian mind, teaching them how to think Christian. That's what's going on in our schools. And if it's not going on in our schools, we ought to make some changes, right? But I think it is. I think it is based on the, our study that we've been doing. Now, why do I focus on others first? Because I think the Bible says it very clearly in Philippians 2, 3 to 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. So I say to you, what is the ultimate advantage of Adventist education? And I provide the answer there, educating for eternity. Now, a long time ago in Simi Valley, that's in California, there was an eighth grade school and there was a teacher named Norman Edwards. And at the end of every school year, he'd sit the kids down and he'd say, now, some of you are graduate, graduating, going on to academy. Some of you are moving. And there's a chance that we may not see each other again. But I'd like to see if you could make a commitment. And so they, you know, they loved Mr. Edwards. They said, sure. So he said, I want you to commit to meet at the tree of life. And he said, there are gonna be lots of people there. So let's meet on the south side of the tree of life. I tell my students now when I have the chance, too many people at the south side because Mr. Edwards' students are gonna be there. Let's meet on the west side, that's California side. <laughs> but I work with um, a a professor at La Sierra, she wrote the book Thriving, Amy Leukert. She was one of his students. And she tells me today, she remembers that very day when he asked them to make the commitment. She made it and she has not gone away from it. And she has four kids. So she's hoping the four kids will make that kind of commitment as well. So that I think is the biggest, the greatest, advantage of Adventist education. We know where we're headed. We should help our children, our students head that way. We should have schools where they see Jesus everywhere so they can mirror it in their brains, okay? And then behave like Jesus. Thank you for being such a attentive audience. And uh, maybe I'll see you next year. You know, I want to, could I, if I could just say this, 
Um, I know two of your teachers very well. I know Julie Abrahamson and I know Melissa Morris. And I'm going to tell you sincerely and genuinely, you could have not have two better teachers in Iowa, Missouri. So you're blessed. Okay, thank you. Oh, did you? What happened to my con my? I guess I just brought this. Yeah, right. Okay. Thank you so much. I was trying to get my daughter to put my granddaughter in Adventist school, so I'm going to share all the information you just gave me. Okay. Uh, wh what? Where do you live? And for She's the in Florida. Dr. Oh. Okay. To to prove what we already know is true. That by beholding you, we're changed. I ask you now to bless each of our schools in a very special way, or that more kids will have the opportunity to come to our schools and to get to know you better. Bless our teachers and the work that's being done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Where, because we're working with the school in Florida, 